Spookies, and welcome to Rick or Treat Horror Cast, hosted by yours ghoulie, Ricky J. Duarte. Now, if you've been following along with the show, you know I've been fortunate enough to cover the opening of a brand new horror play on Broadway called Grey House for RueMorgue.com. The play's written by the insanely talented Levi Holloway, and it stars Tony winner Laurie Metcalf, as well as Tatiana Maslany, Millicent Simmons, and Paul Sparks, and it's directed by Joe Mantello, the Tony-winning director of Wicked. Now, in addition to reviewing the play, I was invited back to participate in the press line on the opening night red carpet, and I interviewed the cast and creative team, as well as some celebrity attendees. Now, that red carpet coverage, my conversation with Laurie Metcalf, my banter with Michael Yuri, all of those interviews, as well as my review of the play, are all available on RueMorgue.com. Well, I'm honored to share that my review of the play was very well received by the producing team, and they generously invited me back a third time to participate as the special guest in a post-show discussion with Grey House's lead co-producer, Tom Kierdehy, after the performance on Thursday, June 15th, 2023. Now, the thing is, this is a play you have to talk about after you've seen it. There is a lot going on, so... This series of post-show talkbacks known as Show and Hell, as an allusion to a key moment in the play, is a chance for the audience to engage in a discussion with industry professionals to mull over the themes and theories surrounding the lore of Grey House. Well, when I tell you this was one of the most exciting moments of my life, in addition to writing and podcasting, I'm also an actor and singer, which frankly, I believe allowed me to approach this opportunity with a very unique perspective. To be able to stand in a Broadway house and discuss my two biggest passions, horror and theater, with a Tony-winning producer was, without a doubt, one of the most exciting moments of my life and a real step in the direction I'd like to head as a horror journalist. It's even led to an upcoming column for Room Morgue I'll be calling Stage Fright, in which I'll be documenting productions of horror on stage throughout the ages. Now, I cannot recommend this play enough. It's frightening and beautiful and cathartic and sad. It's brilliant. It's my opinion it's best to see this piece with as little information about it as possible, so I will share with you the description of the plot as relayed through the official press release. Here it is. When a couple crashes their car in the mountains, they seek shelter in an isolated cabin. Its inhabitants, though somewhat unusual, are eager to make their guests feel right at home. But as the blizzard outside rages on, and one night turns into several, the couple becomes less and less sure of what's true, about their hosts, themselves, and why that sound in the walls keeps getting louder. Now, if you live in New York City or are visiting soon and plan to see this play, and you totally should see this play, I encourage you to stop listening now. Because this post-show discussion is going to contain some major spoilers. It's more important to me to support this gorgeous work of art and support horror on stage than to ruin the experience for you for the sake of more downloads of my podcast. So, go see the play. And then come back and listen to my podcast. (laughs) Tickets are available on the show's website, greyhousebroadway.com. In addition, there are opportunities for discounted rush tickets, and there is a ticket lottery available as well. Now, I understand the majority of my listeners are not in New York City and probably won't be able to see this play. If you're comfortable with spoilers, the discussion is still very interesting. We talk about what horror means to us and what scares us, as well as the themes of grief and love and trauma. Also, I should note that the discussion has been edited a little bit, as there were moments when some audience members commented without a microphone and were either too difficult to hear on the recording or they couldn't be heard at all. I did leave some of these quieter moments in, and while they are on the quiet side, it's my opinion they are worth trying to hear. 
And speaking of sound, a very special thank you goes to my pal Roman Cimienti of The End Audio for recording this discussion so I could share it with all of you. And now, without further ado, I present to you, live from Broadway's beautiful and spooky Lyceum Theater, Show and Hell, a discussion with Greyhouse producer Tom Kierdehy. Let's go trick-or-treating. learned that one of the things that people love most about Grey House is the conversation that happens afterwards. So we invite you to share some of your thoughts. Someone will be in the audience with a microphone, but I'm going to kick it off with a question to Ricky. Um, Ricky, uh, you've written about the significance of genre labels and what you view as the possibilities of horror as a genre. You compared Grey House to an A24 deep thinker. Could you share your thoughts about Grey House as a play that touches several genres that are genres that are rarely seen on Broadway? We're just starting out with the hard questions. <laughs> it's a great question. I love to talk about this because so many people will openly say, I hate horror. I don't like horror. Horror exists in many places. In Disney's Sleeping Beauty, when Princess Aurora is hypnotized and being lulled to the spindle, that's horror. In Jurassic Park, which you think is like an action-adventure film, when Dr. Sattler's running from the Velociraptor through the control room and she's trying to get out, that's horror. It exists all over. When you talk about an A24, did anybody else think A24 in their heads when they saw this? A little bit, maybe. I love what they produce. I would love to see what this might translate to on film because there are so many genres, so many themes within this play. If you look at something like The Woman in Black, incredible play, pretty good movie, very different experiences, right? I feel really fortunate to have seen this piece, this play, in this form, in its intended original format. I think that Levi Holloway did a remarkable job putting together a piece that speaks to so many themes. Uh, Grief, love, and trauma are the three things that I take from this piece. And th <laughs> through years of therapy, I'm finding that those are three things that live very closely together within the same, perhaps, house, right? And so just as genres can coexist, I think that themes like that can coexist within the same piece as well. And that is my answer. Grief, love, and trauma. How many, anyone here respond to that comment? Want to give us a show of hands? Or would you like to comment on that? Right here, we have someone. Here, I'll take it. I mean, I think I've experienced with grief, love, and trauma in my work as a PA in a hospital. When, with the heights of COVID and with everything that went down in the hospital, there was a lot of love amongst the staff and love toward our patients, but a lot of grief and a lot of trauma. And I think I've done a decent job of packaging a lot of that away and that this is kind of my solve for the trauma I guess that I've gone through with COVID. So with, with treating and people, some who survived and plenty who didn't. So it was a lot. Thank you. Um, Ricky, you wrote in your review of Grey House uh, that it's a frightening exploration of the fears we take with us and the fears we leave behind. And I'd love if you can talk about that. I, I, when I was first sent the play, part of my response, my visceral excited response was that it, it felt like it crawled inside my soul and touched my fears and, and sort of um, the things, the fears that I've stuffed away and the fears that I try to confront. And every night when we perform the play and I stand on the sidewalk, people come up to me and want to talk about it. And, and that's why we've created this series, Show and Hell. But our fears are, are, are a, a, a theme that most people seem to think that Grey House unearths and addresses. And I'm curious what it did the first time you saw it. I had a reaction, similar, not to call you out, um, 
but this is but my third time seeing it, and it's the third time that I've had the same reaction in the same places of this play. I think that what draws me to horror is that fear is universal. It is perhaps the first thing we ever feel as soon as we're born. Uh, I think that the things that fear one, that frighten one person might not frighten someone else, but I have to say my experience with this piece has been very interesting. I'll try to make this succinct. The first time that I came about a month ago, I was with my very best friend who was eight months pregnant. We were kind of worried that this might induce labor. It did not. <laughs> Second time, she didn't come with me. Third time, she didn't come because she gave birth the other day. I feel that the symbolism within this play about portals, about space and where you come from and where you go is the most profound thing to be afraid of when Raleigh leaves at the end and she doesn't know what's out there. She doesn't know where she's going. She doesn't know what the world looks like anymore that's fucking scary. Like, that's very frightening. And I think when I uh, was so fortunate enough to interview the cast and creative of this wonderful show, I asked every single person, what are you afraid of? And the answer I got most often was the unknown. And I love that. The second most popular answer was sharks and jaws. <laughs> but the, the unknown. And I can't not, I have to agree with that. Let's talk a little more about fear. What are some of your fears? Anyone want to share some of the fears that were on Earth tonight? Sir. Being alone is a big fear that a lot of us have, right? So, and I got a lot of that from this, is that you know, they all they don't want her to be, you know, she doesn't want to stay, but she doesn't want to be alone. She sees at the end this, you know, child coming in, feeling alone, and she did, and that's a big fear that I have, is just being alone. Dying alone, all that stuff that's people. This gentleman said being alone is, is a fear of his, and it, it's clear that it's, or, or I, I think I heard that you feel Max feels that she's afraid of being alone also. Anyone else? This gentleman right here? Jump scares. <laughs> you're, you're afraid of jump scares? Yeah. Did you jump when the ancient came out? They got me. Good. <laughs> that's, that's what we want. Someone on this side of the room? This gentleman? When he said, I'm afraid that if you really know me, you won't, you won't love me. That, that really strikes a chord with me uh, as well. Someone, anyone else? Okay, so Ricky, you said, you know, you focused on Raleigh and that she's going out into the vast unknown, but I'm curious, um, and it sounds like we have a few theories on it. Why do you think Max chooses to stay? That's, that's the question, right? I think that the themes of motherhood exist, the themes of kind of women helping one another, and the cyclical behavior of violence against women are what speak to me in this piece. And... Um, when Max is ready to run out the door and she sees this young child shaking and in need, she can't not leave, she can't leave this child behind. And um, there's compassion there. And I think when people think of horror, they often think of meanness or um, blood and guts and gore, and those all exist. And I find entertainment for various reasons and all sorts of horror, but there's also compassion. Wes Craven said, People go to horror for catharsis. And holy cow, how true is that, right? The horror genre can elevate real life situations and explain it in a way that feels safe and just out of this world bizarre. And I think there's something universally connective to that. And um, so I, I, for, I, Max, le Max does not leave because maybe she was that little girl and no one was there to help her. Let's hear some other theories. Any, anyone else? Uh, over there? Uh, you have a, in the back with a mask? Yeah. I think about whether or not it's her sister. <laughs> I think it's her dead sister, personally. Uh, can, you re can you start from the top? Can you repeat that? Oh, we've been having a whole fight over here about whether or not Good. it's her sister. Good, that's what we want. <laughs> we can you say that over, though? I'm sorry. Okay. 
Um, yeah, we've been having a whole fight over whether or not it's her sister. I think it. she was trying to leave, opens the door, sees her dead sister, and the house knew what it needed to bring her to keep her here. Okay, who else thinks that? See a show of hands. All right, there's a fight going over the, on over there. I think that, I think that now. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, I, I have a question. Sure. So when one leaves and another one comes in, it was very profound. Can you explain the concept behind that? Because that's... Uh, I'm going to flip it on you. I'm not the playwright. I'm the producer. Uh, and, and I think the answer lives inside Levi Holloway's mind. But I would ask, what, what do you think that's about? I mean, my, free, my reaction was, you know, this whole household was pulled together. But when one walked out the door, they, there was a statement that said another one comes in. Yes. And I was struck by that because that's how it ended. And, I mean, I'm, I'm still trying to interpret it, to be honest with you. Sure. But it, it really caught my attention, because it very clearly was stated. And then that's how it ended. Okay, so this woman has questions. What, how, what do you feel about that? This... I feel like it was a sense of, like, a cycle. Like, she wanted to leave so badly. We saw the franticness. Um, something, how she had her shoes on, but nobody else had them on. It's a sense that she was ready to get her foot out the door and like be out of there. But when the woman, the little kid came in, she stopped everything and she realized it has to continue. It's like a force that just stays there forever. Like she might want to leave, but it's going to forever continue. There are nights where I'm here and, you know, I've seen the play literally about a hundred times and I, uh, I'll be doing some work in the lobby and I'll run in to experience that moment because I think it's emotionally so powerful. A few more theories on that moment. Anyone else? Right up here, this gentleman. My brother actually had a fascinating theory. He actually thought that this was some sort of purgatory in the sense that uh, w w there's some sort of limited capacity and, that, and when one ghost, for lack of a better word, is ready to move on for find some sort of closure, it makes room for another spirit to enter to p hopefully find some sort of peace or redemption. And it's also interesting that when you say when one leaves, another uh, c uh, comes to replace. Uh, uh, notice that Rowley, uh, let ha she had to leave to make room for Max as well, which is also kind of fascinating that for, for whatever reason, the two of them could not somehow coexist in that area together. So we have something in common because my brother on his way out said, I think they're existing in a form of purgatory. Um, who else feels like that? Someone we haven't heard from first? This gentleman right here. Let me get the mic to you. I suppose it was Sartre who said that hell is other people. And in this way, it's sort of a a never-ending loop, an eternal sort of catharsis in that there's always someone coming, someone going. It's a little like the theatrical experience. I think that's beautiful. It's a little like the theatrical experience. Anyone else? This woman over here. Um, I, I don't think it's a, lit a, well, a metaphorical purgatory. I actually think it's a literal one in the generational trauma of women and how they've been treated throughout time. Um, and the work is not done, and I feel like that is the ultimate comment that this play has to say, is that we got work to do. I will tell you that's one of the reasons I produced this play. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, Ricky, you wrote so beautifully about the play, and there's another line uh, from your review that I pulled because it really speaks to me. There's a sort of malicious coziness within its meticulously cluttered walls. Talk to me about that sentence, that feeling, that thought. I, look, look at it, first of all. <laughs> there's so much detail in this gorgeous set. And the three times that I've seen it, I notice something new every day. The shape of this space, rounded but angular, it, this giant gaping 
whole, I mean, not to sound crude, but you know, if I go back to the idea that's in my head now that I've you know experienced childbirth, uh, you know, we have entrances through. <sighs> All right, let's get back to your question. <laughs> well, well let, me, let me just pose it slightly differently. Malicious and cozy don't often find themselves in the same sentence. So let's break that down a little bit. All right, they don't find themselves in the same sentence, but I do think that they go together quite often. I think that people uh, tend to stick with what they know, whether that's comfortable for them or not. Um, I think that, you know, uh, um, Raleigh develops an affection for the house, and yet she said she cried so hard she um, what, almost swallowed her heart. Is that the line? Um, and yet, through it, the girls are not nice to her, right? We accept the kind of, to quote that book, we accept the kind of love we think we deserve, and the things that we are shown are the things, the only things that we know. Um, malicious and comforting. I think I've been there, you know? And it's unfortunate that it took Raleigh 35 years to get out. Thank you. Y yes. I think that paradox that Ricky is talking about is very obvious because the thing that she does, I mean, the most joyful moment in the play was when she was feeding them. She was giving them physical substance that was feeding their spirit. And yet when she decided to come back, the first thing she did again was to feed them. So she is physically feeding uh, a hollow soul to fill up its spirit and to find something within it. Max was physically feeding a hollow soul and she came back to provide it sub sustenance. Is, is that, I, I think that's beautifully articulated. Others have a thought about that? No, but I have a the, different question. <laughs> bring it on. The, the door and the stairwell going down, the symbolism behind that, what's the story of how that is integrated into... Well, once again, I'm, I'm tossing it back. Let's hear some theories about the stairway into the basement. This gentleman right here. Um, so in following with the themes of love and grief and trauma, I feel like the basement is like a deeper variable of that. I think it's a deeper area of that trauma. And I think when they're here, they can approach the love portion of that. And that's when the cooking comes into play. That's when there are certain moments, even when she was sleeping on the couch, like there was a, a moment where one of the girls was like touching her, was having that moment. Um, and then she went down to the basement and while Max was being confronted with truths, she was going through the pain that was more excruciating than the pain that she experienced up here. So I feel like that's just a, a deeper variable. Anyone else? I like, no, no, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're doing this, these, this talkback series, because we think it's a lot of fun well, to... I feel like when the door would open and then the, there would be like clouds of smoke, it's like, it was a deeper, darker hole that was happening. I, I think that this gentleman would agree. Um, and it feels like a lot of the audience would too. There's a, a woman over here who... I would point out that the, the character that we saw most going down there was Squirrel. And she was the one who left at the end, which I think signified that to some degree her trauma had healed and she was able to move out of that literal purgatory. So while the other sisters and the boy were sleeping upstairs, she was just in a distinctly separate part of the house. So if there is symbolism to the basement or to the stairs leading down, I, I think it might have to do with um, relief from trauma or healing, or that's what, what makes sense to me from the way it was staged. I think that's an extraordinary observation. Anyone else? This woman right here. The only two people you saw ever going downstairs were Raleigh and Squirrel. And those are the two people who ended up leaving at the end. So thinking about that relief of trauma, um, 
those are the two who ended, but then still the connection to it because you know that Raleigh will be feeling that forever. That is never something that will ever leave her. Um, so there's always the connection to that kind of gray space within ourselves, I feel like, is kind of a thing that is within the gray houses. There's the the space between fear and love and grief and trauma and that it is always connected but never quite clear, if that makes sense. <laughs> We're hearing a lot tonight. Okay, um, Ricky, I, I told you I would be asking you this. Uh, there's a moment where A1656 says to Max, um, I'm so proud of you. Soon you'll know all the languages of the house. And for some reason, that line moves me very deeply every night. And I'm just curious about your thoughts on that line, and then I'd like to turn it to the audience and have a conversation about the languages of the house. So having been asked this before the play, this was something that I particularly paid, paid attention to this evening, and that scene is, is followed by one of my absolute favorite moments when Bernie with the potato peeler, um, and the house is, is, you know, Raleigh's upset. Raleigh has so many emotions and feelings, and the house breathes. And the, there's a light shift, right, as the breath in and out of this house. And in my interpretation is that this is the house explaining or bringing comfort to Raleigh that it's time to go. And, uh, you know, sitting down just after that to have her hair braided and Marlo telling the story, it's a moment perhaps of acceptance. And I, but then at the end when she tries to make eggs for the girls, the house tells her you have to go, right? I think that the house, from what I'm observing, provides the truth of a situation, whether these people want to hear it or not. Is this place like, oppressive and difficult. There is oppression and there's a difficult experience in this place, but I think that only through facing that can anybody move past. Right? The only way out is through, as people say. And um, so, you know, having been fortunate enough to see this multiple times, the house absolutely communicates and if you're lucky, you get to start understanding what it says. That's great. Um, we know that there's English spoken in the house. We know that there's ASL. We know there's Morse code. And we trust that the house has a language of its own. Anyone else have any other theories on how the house speaks to the characters in the play? This, I'm going to have this gentleman, we just, I just want to share the opportunities. Just. When she touched the wall, of, oh sorry, when she touched the wall over there and the lights went bright, it seemed like it soothed the house in some way, right? So it communicates through touch as well, I would think. Um, back there. The music plays such a big part in the communication between the girls especially, so I would say that's another one. Music plays such a big part between the girls, and she, this woman would say that's another one of the languages of the house. I, I, and I think, I, I, I love the ritualized um, way the girls spend time together, the, that malicious coziness. I, I feel like the girls find comfort in their rituals around dinner and music, and I'm, I'm always struck by that uh, every time I see it. Um, we're down to the last few minutes, and um, I believe you mentioned the word gray and the gray in our lives. And, and I'm curious, Ricky, about your thoughts on the title, Gray House. And then I'd love to hear a few other thoughts on why Gray House, why gray? Uh, it kind of goes back to when I was able to speak to Levi Holloway and talking about how he wrote this in a way that people would leave taking things away from it that he didn't even intend. And I think that providing that gray space, that gray area, these shades of gray open for interpretation is what has made this beautiful piece of art. And when it comes down to it, just like every single person's contribution to this conversation tonight, there's no definitive black or white answer. Uh, we, taste and interpretation are subjective. And 
I think when a play can show us all of these different shades of gray and we leave wanting to sit down and discuss every single shade of gray, we're very fortunate. And um, so thank you, Levi. We're gonna resist 50 shades of gray jokes. Um, uh, anyone wanna share their theories on the title? No, I just have one more question. The refrigerator, was that like a capsule of the history of what went through well, you know that I'm not going to give you an answer. Uh, the, the question is, was the refrigerator a capsule of what everyone went through? And, and again, that, that answer exists in Levi's mind and amongst the interpretations that we all may have. I'll, I'll ask one person to maybe respond. Anyone? This, uh, this gentleman and then this gentleman. You notice all the bottles have names as, as in pre at previous persons and, and towards the end, uh, Harold, Henry, whatever, uh, you know, it seemed like his essence was drawn into a jar and then put in the fridge as well. So I, to me, it was kind of obvious, but you know, it's open to interpretation. <laughs> Thank you. There's and this gentleman, in the refrigerator. there are a whole lot of bottles in that refrigerator. And okay, remember, this gentleman. And anytime then... someone goes out, someone comes back in. So someone else brings their new trauma their new person, the new, the new evil that they have to get out and put it in there. But then also the refrigerator also gives them their sustenance. Like when, when they need to get the poison out, yeah. you know what I mean? The poison's there. When they need to get the sustenance, the sustenance is there. So the, the house is providing uh, what they need whenever they need it. You know? Thank you. Okay, so here's a promise I'm going to make you. You're going to be thinking about this play tomorrow and you're going to want to talk about it to someone. And um, I encourage you to look at our Reddit page. We have Greyhouse Broad B Way uh, on, our, on Reddit. Um, go to our Instagram page or our social media. There are conversations happening all over the city, and frankly, at this point, all, ac all across the country uh, that are similar to this. People have really extraordinary theories, and we believe that the best art leaves us questioning and hungry for more and is, is open to interpretation. So I encourage you to follow us on social media. Please tell your friends about us, but keep the conversation alive because the greatest thing about Grey House is it stays with you long after the curtain goes down. I wanna give a shout out to Ricky Duarte. Um, Ricky writes for Rue Morgue and his podcast is Rick or Treat. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thanks for coming to Grey House. Thanks for coming Rick or Treating. It'd be a real scream if you'd take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review the show on whatever platform you're listening on. Visit my website, rickertreat.com, for more information about Rick or Treat HorrorCast, as well as direct access to my writing contributions to Rumorg and spoilerfreereviews.com. Website designed by Evelyn DeVere. The show's spooky intro and outro music is a cover of Camille Saint-Saëns' Danse Macabre, with orchestrations composed and performed by Lestat von Monlicht. The Rick or Treat logo was designed by Philip Romano. Information about these artists is available in the episode description. Check them out, they're frighteningly talented. Rick or Treat Horrorcast is produced independently by me, Ricky J. Duarte, of Rick or Treat Productions. If you enjoyed what you heard, tell a fiend. I mean, friend. If you didn't, well, they're coming to get you, listener. <laughs>